to the uh, Frisco Historic Park and Museum. Uh, we have a beautiful day out here right now. We get to be in the gazebo. If you were here last week, it's probably a nice change of pace than being crowded into the Log Chapel. Um, so today we have uh, Nina from the Aspen Historical Society and Skylar, a uh, Northern Ute tribal member, and they're going to be presenting stories of the Noosh, tales from the Ute people. Um, they'll present both the history of the native people of Colorado and the modern day Ute experience. It's a great one, so I'm really happy that you all are here today. Um, next week, our next uh, lecture will be Lost Lodges of the Rocky Mountain National Park with Dave Lively, and that one will be back in the chapel again. Um, but a couple other things going on through the historic park, just wanted to let you guys know about before we begin. Um, on Friday, we have the free historic town tour. Um, we will be meeting at the Schoolhouse Museum, just that building over there, at 10 a.m. Um, it's free, you don't have to uh, reserve a spot at all, so just show up at 10 a.m. with your beautiful, happy, shining faces, and we will take a walk back in time down Main Street, all the way down to the marina. Saturday, um, we will be having the Mason Town Hiking Tour, which goes about halfway up Mount Royal. It's a beautiful hike with a little bit of elevation gain, about 500 feet, so be prepared for that. If you guys are interested in that, uh, feel free to sign up in the museum. Um, after the lecture or you can call in and sign up for that. We still have some spaces left. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Skylar and Nina and I really hope you guys enjoy today's lecture. Thank you so much. Well, thank you and welcome everyone. My name is Nina Gabbianelli. I'm actually the Vice President at the Aspen Historical Society. And um, along with Skylar Loma Heftiwa, we have been doing this presentation here, I think this is our fifth year. So I'm curious, has anyone been to one of our talks before? Okay, for those few that did raise your hands, thank you for coming again. No spoilers, okay, because I'm going to tell some of the same stories. Well, I am actually going to, I'm doing one new one, maybe. I can never remember what I tell you all, so. Um, Thank you. So Skylar and I have the great opportunity of um, working within the school districts all throughout the Roaring Fork Valley, the Eagle River Valley, even on out to Parachute and, and, and Rifle and such um, throughout the school year, sharing the story of the Native people. Um, but unlike most presentations where um, your tribal member would show up in full regalia, uh, we do a program where I'm going to talk to you. I'm non-native. I'm born in St. Louis, Missouri. All right? Gabby and Ellie. I'm Italian-American. But, uh, but uh, so I'm going to share with you what it was like and what happened. But Skylar's going to share with you what it's like now, what it's like to grow up as a modern-day Ute. Because the Ute people are not dead. They are just not here in Colorado predominantly as they were for hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands and thousands of years. We truly don't know um, because the stories are all we have. And the stories were handed down generation to generation, grandparents to children typically is how it would be done. And as the elders, the grandparents, they are the ones that know the most, right? They um, would share the history. But each family or clan within the, the, the tribes, and there were seven tribes within the Ute Nation. And each of the stories were a little bit different, right? So the history is not necessarily agreed upon, even between the different tribes or the different families today. Um, we do know in the Roaring Fork Valley in Glenwood Springs, there were bones found in a cave back in the 1990s. Those bones were removed with the sacred rites of a Ute tribal member um, and studied by the Smithsonian. They were dated over 8,000 years old. So we know there was human life in Glenwood Springs over 8,000 years ago, 6,000 BC, let's say. Some Ute elders say yes, that is a Ute person. Some say no, it was the people before the Ute people. Um, However, for this presentation, we're going to go with the interpretation that they are the first people of Colorado. They were hunters, they were nomadic, so they were traveling through the mountains following herds of deer and elk, so they were here in the summertime when the water resource is abundant, right, when the plant life was excessive, when the animals were here, but as people and animals, as animals began to migrate and the snow began to fall, they moved further west, further south, and the Ute Nation encompassed most of what we call Colorado and Utah, 
a state named for the Utah people, parts of Wyoming, parts of New Mexico. The Uncompagre band claims uh, ties to the kind of central mountains where we are, um, and the Uncompagre band is the band that Schuyler's ancestors are um, from. Now, the first story that I want to share with you is the first story that would be shared with children, because without schools, they had to learn their lessons, right and wrong, how things came to be. Everything they learned, they learned from their elders, and most of it was shared through stories. So the, you know, the art form of storytelling traces back to almost every native culture around our world and indigenous peoples. And one of the first stories is always the creation story. So I would like to share with you a version of the Ute creation story. Because even if you go to the Southern Ute uh, Museum, the, the, the museum down in Ignacio, there's a beautiful Smithsonian and Ute created museum. The first exhibit is five different elders telling the Ute creation story five different ways. So there are many different versions to this story. This just happens to be my favorite. So, the Ute people believe in a creator named Sinawaf, okay? They believe that Sinawaf created everything. The clouds, the snow, the flowers, the elk, the mountains, the rocks, the rivers, everything. Everything that we see, Sinawaf creates first, before people. He gets all the animals living peacefully amongst each other, and that took quite a long time. Then it's time to add the humans. But in order to add people, he had to make people. And in order to make people, he went out into the land and he began to gather sticks. Now he picked up long sticks, and short sticks, tall sticks, small sticks, round sticks, flat sticks. They were all different colors, all different sizes. And he made a big pile next to him. And he sat down and he began to tie these sticks together, creating stick people. Now each time he finished a person, he put him into a big leather pouch or bag that he had next to him. So he spent days making the stick people, putting them in the bag, making the stick people, putting them in the bag, making the stick people, putting them in the bag. When he was finished, he tied that bag up real tight with a knot because he had to go out into the land to see where the people should go. The hunter did need to be up here high in the mountains where the elk and the deer and the mountain bison were. And then the fisherman, though, needs to be where there's lots of water so he can fish. And the farmer, where the land is flat and the sun is in the sky all day long, not shaded by mountains. So while he's out in the land, he didn't want to have to carry that big heavy bag with him. So he asks his friend, the coyote, to watch the bag for him. All right, so some of you know where I'm going. The coyote is often called the trickster, the prankster, the troublemaker, the mischief one, right? In most of the stories of this, you know, region, the coyote represents, he's like that, that archetype of the trickster, okay? Now, I don't believe he's evil. I don't think he's the devil. I don't think he listens to directions. And because he doesn't listen to directions, he doesn't do what he's told. And because he doesn't do what he's told, he gets into trouble. In every story, the coyote gets into trouble, right? But Sinawaf created coyote. He loves coyote. He trusts coyote. So he hands coyote the big heavy bag, and he says, oh, watch my bag for me while I'm out in the land. But whatever you do, coyote, do not open the bag. It was one instruction. Do not open the bag. Sinawaf goes away. What do you suppose Coyote did? He opens the bag. Now, I think he probably sat there with it for a while, but there was a smell. A sm it was a... <sighs> no, he had never smelled it before. And there's a sound, like, like voices. Something, there's something inside the bag, and he needs to know what it is. He's so curious, he finally opens the bag. And when he does, out pops all the stick people, and they start walking around, and everybody's talking to each other. The only problem was they were speaking in different languages. And because they were speaking in different languages, they couldn't understand each other. So they talked a little bit louder. Well, that didn't do anything but make people angry. So now people are yelling at each other, screaming at each other, and soon fists are being thrown. And the coyote, he's getting very nervous. He needs everyone to get back into the bag. But no one can hear him because they're all running around. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're going off in different directions. And the next thing you know, everybody was gone out in the land. 
and the bag was open, Sanawaf was returning, and Coyote realized, uh-oh, he was in trouble again. And when Sanawaf came back and he saw that bag open, he was mad. He was really, really mad. He says to Coyote, I don't think you realize what you have done. Now the people are out in the land, they're in the wrong places. They are going to fight with each other because they can't communicate. They don't speak the same language. They're going to fight. And what they're going to fight about is the land, and there will be many wars. Sinawaf predicts wars over land in the Ute creation story. Hmm. Right? Now he's so mad at Coyote, he banishes Coyote to the woods. He says, you have to go live alone off up in the hills by yourself forever. So the Ute people believe that when the coyote howls at night, <laughs> he's crying because he's lonely. He wants to come home, but Sinawaf will not let him. Now Sinawaf goes over to that bag, and you know what? There were still people down in the bottom of the bag. So he puts his hand way down into the bottom of the bag, and he pulls out those remaining stick people, and he tells them they are his chosen people. They are the Ute people. And he places them here high in the mountains where they can be closer to him, their creator, and where they can watch over the land, take care of the land. The tree is your brother. It has a life and a soul the same as you. The elk, even though you take the life of an elk, you give thanks to that elk for its sacrifice. Thank you. So that your family and tribe can survive, right? They use everything about the animal, from the brains, to the tail, to the teeth, to the meat, to the skins, to the bones, to the intestines, to the sinew, everything about that animal, right? Now, the Ute people did travel up into these high mountains, we know for at least um, hundreds of years because of the evidence that is available. And the stories with uh, Spanish explorers as they began to come up into this area and trade horses with the native people. So they were walking back and forth through these mountains for hundreds, maybe thousands of years every year. Say I, 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 I use Grand Junction to Aspen as an example. Back and forth every year, okay? Um, horses introduced to them in the 15, 1600s. Now they become great equestrians. They become one of the first tribes. They claim to be one of the first tribes to, to gain the horses from the Spanish and then introduce them to the Plains Indians. So that real iconic image of an Indian on a horse, that doesn't start till like 16, 1700 in the U.S., right? Um, so the native Ute people fight for their land. They protect their lands from other tribes, right? They are warriors. They're here in this area, but the trading with the Spanish explorers is rather peaceful. They're just coming through and exploring, and there isn't real conflict necessarily um, until actually Mexico fights with Spain to acquire the land in Western Colorado, what we call Western Colorado. And then the U.S. fights with Mexico because they wanted the land, okay? So 1848 is the year that the United States acquires the land that is in western Colorado. But what white man could live up here? So they just left it to the native people for another decade until 1858 when gold was discovered down in Cherry Creek. And people, non-native people, began to move west into the eastern slope, the flat Denver area, and mine up on kind of some of these eastern slopes. Um, and in 1861, the territory of Colorado is established, a few years later. A couple of years after that, there's a treaty signed by Honest Abe Lincoln. Honest Abe signs a treaty with the Ute people, giving them everything west of the Continental Divide in perpetuity, which means forever. And yet, that's where I live. So, what happened? Well, you see, over the course of the 1860s and the 1870s, there were many studies being done. Um, geological surveys, the Hayden survey is kind of the big one. 
but it was proven that th there was a mineral belt that extended from Boulder down through the Rocky Mountains to Durango, and that mineral belt contained not only gold, but also silver, copper, lead, tin, coal, all of which we needed as a growing nation. So the treaties began to change a little bit. First we take back the San Juan Mountains, the Telluride area. I'm just going to let it pass. Then they begin to change the treaties, promising the native people food, annuities for the, in exchange for their lands. Um, and there are agencies set up around um, the area. And um, in 1876, Colorado became a state. August 1876, we're the centennial state. 38th state in our union. And at that time, tens of thousands of non-natives live in the eastern front range and the back two-thirds of our state was about three or 4,000 native people and a few mining camps, okay? So in 1879, a couple of different things happened. A, the U.S. government decides to inflate the price of silver and begin to buy silver and gold to back the dollar. In other words, go west, mine silver, we're going to buy it at an inflated price as much as you can provide, and the Rocky Mountains are full of them. Full of it. <laughs> so that provided a, a, a motivation for people to move into what was native land, right? So there were conflicts in that area. Then also, in the fall of 1879, there was a battle in northwestern Colorado in the Meeker area. Nathan Meeker, non-native Nathan Meeker, was the agent overseeing the Indian agency in that area. And he had um, some different ideas on how the native people should live. He didn't want them to be nomadic. He didn't want them to be hunters. He wanted them to be farmers. He didn't want them to acquire horses. He wanted them to kill off their horse population, stop racing, we'll dig up the land, we can farm that land. Um, you need to be Christian. A lot of ideas that just didn't work with the way the native people believe they should be living, right? So there was a battle in the fall of 1879 in northwestern Colorado. It's often referred to as the Meeker Massacre, but I'm going to call it the Meeker Incident because a massacre would imply that they didn't know they were going to be fired upon. But what really happened was the native people um, told the military when called in to protect poor Nathan Meeker, um, and you can see my bias, um, the um, military agents, some of whom the native people have fought with in the Civil War, so native people fought for this land, not the government, the land, right? And they fought with uh, Major Thornburg. They say, don't cross this line. If you cross this line, we're going to attack, okay? That, that is not a surprise, right? They crossed the line. The Ute people did attack. There were many lives lost. Both Nathan Meeker and Major Thornburg were killed. Um, many Ute lives were lost as well. And what happened was there were two women and three children taken hostage, white women and children, taken hostage by the northern Ute tribe. And um, they were held in captivity for 23 days. Now, there are varying stories upon what happened. Um, Josephine Meeker, Nathan's daughter, actually initially said when returned to her family in Denver uh, after 23 days of captivity that she had been well cared for and there was no harm done to them. Within the native tribe, it was very common that if you kill the father in a battle, you're going to take the wife and child into your family and care for them. That was your duty. That was your obligation, right? So that's one side. The other side would be that as the media got involved and started to change the story, the natives had been savage, they'd been ravaged. And what it did was it incited Governor Pitkin, who was the governor of a three-year-old state at this point, representing tens of thousands of non-natives who lived here, he removed the native people. His campaign was, the Utes must go. That was the headline of the Denver Post with a really horrible <coughs> photograph to go with it or, or drawing. So the native people were removed by 1880 to reservations. There are three Ute reservations. Remember, there were seven tribes within the Ute Nation, or perhaps even more. But seven tribes were consolidated to three reservations. Two in southern Colorado, one's around Ignacio. That's the southern Ute reservation. Then there's the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation in the Four Corners area. And the Uncompahgre and the Uinta and the White River Utes were um, given land in northeastern Utah. Now, that area is flat and 
barren and not a lot of water. It's rock. It's nothing like the mountains that the Uncompagre were familiar with, that's for sure. So they had to change how they lived. They had to change how they uh, ate. The, uh, everything about their lifestyle had to change in order to survive. And they did. And they are, you know, um, uh, actually that land that was given to them that was considered useless in 1880 is now rich with oil and natural gas. So they're actually a, a rather wealthy tribe, yes, we would say? Yeah, Skyler's shaking his head. I just got to make sure I'm right. Um, so the native people over the course of 1880 to today, there have been some other changes. In 1924, they were considered citizens of the United States for the first time. 1924, less than 100 years ago, native people were considered citizens of the United States. And yet we're still arguing over citizenship. Isn't that interesting? So, we try to learn from, from history, you know, when I share this with eight-year-olds, I say, you know, we thought differently as a society a hundred years ago. I couldn't vote a hundred years ago because men thought women had smaller brains, right? So the same was thought of the native people, and, you know, hopefully over time, a hundred years from now, we'll be a little bit further than we are today, right? Um, now... They still couldn't vote, though, even though they were citizens. In fact, there are some northern Ute tribes in northern Colorado that were not given the right to vote until the 1970s. Is that not extraordinary? So the native story has not been shared very often. Um, and Schuyler, gratefully, is of a generation that his parents had enough you know, tradition within their family to share with him. But there are some people who don't. Because the generations from 1880 to 1920s and 1930s and 40s were stripped of their culture. They were taken to boarding schools as children. They were beaten if they spoke their own languages. They did not learn the history. And they didn't want their children to suffer the same way they did, so they didn't teach them anything. So there's two generations that had a difficult time both learning and sharing this story, but now we have a grateful, gratefully, we have a generation that's growing up on the reservation today that, you know, despite the fact that, that they can travel anywhere and live anywhere, the majority of them do still. We have one northern Ute tribal member that lives in the Roaring Fork Valley. From Aspen to Glenwood, one. That's Skyler. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and um, so, but the majority of the Skyler's generation now wants to share the story. They're learning their language and they're sharing it. And by sharing it, we're hoping that we're able to bridge some of the, the misconceptions and the gaps. And that's also why, you know, Skyler brings his regalia, but he doesn't wear his regalia, right? It is not a costume, and I'll let him tell you more about that. But, um, but yet, something like, you know, you, you have a tuxedo if you go to a wedding, right? You, you put on a, a, you know, it's not a costume, it's just your fanciest dress. I got dressed up for you all today, right? <laughs> um, so uh, that is kind of what it was like, what happened. And I'm going to let Skylar tell you, uh, I want to tell one more story. Can I tell one more story? Okay. I want to tell one more story. Um, and this is another Ute story. My, um, when I first began working as a storyteller and beginning to tell native stories, I wanted to tell all Ute stories, right? So I got this great book that was Ute Tales, and a lot of the stories in there, they were warriors, and they were, it was a different culture, and most of the stories are inappropriate for eight-year-olds, unfortunately. So I did find one, it is called The Coyote Steals the Blanket. Okay, so we're going to tell another coyote story, and I'm not bashing on coyotes, I like coyotes, but somebody has to be the troublemaker, right? So the coyote, also a very proud animal, used to walk around in kind of the desert areas of, of Colorado and, and would exclaim quite often, boasting, I am king of the desert, and I can go wherever I want and do whatever I want, and nobody can tell me what to do. Well, a lot of the animals were kind of sick of hearing that. But one day, he's walking around, boasting, and here comes a hummingbird. She comes down to Coyote and says, Coyote, I hope you enjoy your walk today, but whatever you do, do not go into the valley around the rock over that cliff, because it's very dangerous. Coyote looks at the little hummingbird and says, I am king of the desert, and I 
can go wherever I want and do whatever I want, and no one can tell me what to do, especially not a teeny tiny little hummingbird. The hummingbird said, all right, but if you do go into that valley, whatever you do, do not touch any of the beautiful blankets that are covering the rocks in the valley. She flies away. Well, Coyote, of course, went right around that cliff and into that valley, and when he got there, there were dozens and dozens of rocks covered with beautiful blankets. Oh, they were such gorgeous colors. There were green ones and red ones and yellow ones. And oh, there was this one purple blanket. And the coyote went up to it and he, he tied it around his neck like a cape. And he said, why, this is royal. This is befitting king of the desert. And he began to run. And as he did, that blanket waved in the wind. And he thought, this is the way I should travel. And as he's running along with that blanket flowing over his shoulders, he hears this bum 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 behind him. He looks over his shoulder. All he saw was a rock rolling on the ground. So he began to run a little bit faster, and wouldn't you know it, bum 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 He looks behind him. There still is that rock rolling along behind him on the ground. So he was becoming a, a bit puzzled. So he decided he was going to zig to the right which he did, and the rock zigged to the right. And then he zagged to the left, and the rock zagged to the left. Now he was not only puzzled, he was becoming a little concerned. But he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to run up the hill, because we all know a rock cannot go up a hill. So he begins to run up the hill, and as he does, behind him he hears, blum, 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 blum. that rock is coming right up the hill behind him. So now there's something wrong here. This rock seems to be chasing him. And he has to keep running because if he stops, the rock will roll right on top of him. So he continues to run and run and run and run and run and run. And now it's getting to be like close to lunchtime and his pads on his feet are hurting and he needs to stop for a little bit of water. He's thirsty, but he can't stop because that rock is chasing him. And he doesn't know what to do. And that's when he spots a, oh, the bighorn sheep is up there on the left. Now, the bighorn sheep has big, strong hind legs. And if that sheep stands in the path and just kicks at that rock, I'm sure he'll be able to stop the rock. So he runs up to the bighorn sheep and he says, please help me stand in the path of the rock that is chasing me and kick at it. And bighorn sheep says, well, of course I'll help you. He steps on down into the path and here comes the rock. Blump, 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 splat, blump, blump, blump. It just flattened that bighorn sheep right there on the trail. Now the coyote had to keep running. The bighorn sheep kind of shakes it off and walks away. And the coyote is very concerned now because this, this seems that this could be very, very serious. He, he's going to have to keep running forever. And he doesn't know why the rock is chasing him. He's very confused, but he has to keep running. So he keeps running until, oh, thank goodness, there's the elk. The elk is the biggest animal he knows. The elk can stop this rock, no doubt. So he runs up to the elk and he says, Elk, please help me stand in the path of this rock and stop it from chasing me. The elk says, Of course, coyote, I'll be happy to help. He walks down into the path. Here comes the rock. Blump, 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 splat, blump, blump, blump. Knocks that elk right over onto the ground, flattens it, and continues on chasing the coyote. Now the coyote is getting very concerned. It's getting to be dark. And he has been running all day long. He doesn't have much energy left, but this rock is gaining on him. And that's when he hears <laughs> the little hummingbird comes back down and says, Coyote, I can stop the rock from chasing you. The coyote says, Oh, really? A hill couldn't stop the rock. The bighorn sheep couldn't stop the rock. The elk can't stop the rock. But you, teeny tiny little hummingbird, you're going to stop the rock? And she says, Yes. Because, see, I know why the rock is chasing you. I know why it's angry. The spirit of the rock is mad because you took a blanket that did not belong to you. And if you return the blanket, the rock will stop chasing you. And the coyote is running along saying, yep, yeah, the blanket was just sitting there. No one was around. It looks so good on me. I need to keep it. It's beautiful. It's fine. I want it. Then he thought, but if I keep it, I have to keep running forever. So begrudgingly, he unties the blanket, he throws it down on the ground, and that rock comes to a stop, but right on the coyote's tail. So now, he's given, he's, he's given back the blanket, but the rock won't set him free. And the hummingbird says, you need to apologize to the rock, and he will set you free. 
So the coyote turns around to the rock and says, I'm sorry. And the rock rolled off of coyote's tail and coyote took off as fast as he could. And the hummingbird just shook her head and said, you know what? I do not think that coyote will ever learn his lessons. And that is my story. <laughs> So these stories were used to, to teach lessons about, you know, don't steal. That's, that's a good one, right? Um, not to brag, to listen to warnings, right? There's a lot of different lessons within the story that were used to teach. Um, Skyler, however, did go to school and, and learned a lot. And I want to turn the floor over to him now to tell you what it's like to be a modern day Ute in our society, right? In his society. It's ours. It's yours. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Mike. Mike. <laughs> Nuga one. So my name is Skylar Loma Heftiwa. I am of uh, the Northern Ute tribe, and I'm here to share with you a little bit of what it's like to be a Native American or an Indian from India. No, <laughs> but a uh, Ute tribal member. I'm a uh, officially a Ute as uh, it pertains to the United States government. I'm enrolled federally with the Ute tribe of uh, Utah and I'm also part Hopi and part Choctaw so I have a few different native tribes within myself that I was raised with but I identify mainly with Ute and Hopi because those are the two tribes that I was raised with uh, culturally. So let's have another round of applause if we can for Ms. Nina Gabianelli. She's a great storyteller. She's, uh, sometimes I wonder if people question, you know, because uh, she's, like she states, she's a non-native telling these, you know, native stories and everything, but she does a really, really good job. Better than I could do, actually. She's very animated, very descriptive. It, it's very, very um, awesome in my, uh, in my mind, in my perspective. Anyway, so I think she does a really, really good job telling these stories. And um, it hits upon a, a lot of uh, mentalities that are really different because this is the way that Native people teach in the older days as well as today still. Um, when I was growing up in um, elementary school, we had an immersion program called Waikupa, which was uh, teaching the Ute culture, Ute language to us as little kids. And... Part of it was the stories, like the one Nina stated, the creation story, and some of the other, you know, um, children's stories. But these stories are kind of um, the teaching tool on how to be a good person, more or less, and uh, lessons that you learn in life. And they use the characters of nature, like the animals. And in some of these stories, they, they go way back thousands of years where there was a time when... Uh, the animals are like people too, because in a way we're all animals ourselves, you know, we all have made up of the same matter um, organically with, you know, we got a heart, we got eyes, we got hair, some of us more hairy than others, but um, this is kind of the na old style of native belief, a perspective and thought process that we had hundreds and hundreds of years ago was that we're related to the animals and they're related to us. So like we use that in our prayers and some of our thinking in the old days of how we um, hunt, how we pray, you know, the animal spirits are like our brothers or they're a relative of ours, you know, and some of these, um, some of this thinking is how I was raised and also when I got, you know, introduced as a young boy into hunting because hunting is a big part of the Ute culture for hundreds of thousands of years and still is a part of uh, what we do today. Um, but that has changed just like everything else has. And I guess uh, more or less I'm an example of uh, change in culture. And um, 
I guess some of you already know and know this very well that change is a constant thing that happens. Change is always going to happen. 50 years from now, life and society is going to be way different than it was 50 years ago. I'm sure some of you can remember a time when, you know, the mentality in America was different, right? Like everything's different nowadays with technology and social media and just everything's different now. And as opposed to a hundred years ago, everything was different and a couple of hundred years ago. And then 500 years ago when America was wearing, you guys would have been wearing those little white wigs and, you know, everything was different. Fashion changes. And so that's what I like to explain and, you know, compare with our native people as well. Because people will look at me sometimes and think that, well, the culture's gone, you're not a real native because I'm not dressed in a war bonnet or wearing a feather and wearing buckskin clothes. But that's fashion. That's just the, you know, something that native people did 150 years ago. Just like you would have been wearing pioneer clothes. You would have been wearing five layers of clothes to show off how rich you were. You know, just because times were different, the mentality was different 150 years ago. But it's not the same now. This guy's wearing shorts and a nice polo shirt. You know, whereas 150 years ago, that would have been, you know, outrageous. You know, look at this guy, they would have said. You know, just the same with myself. The native people 150 years ago would have looked at me and said, what are you wearing? You know, but maybe they might not have. Maybe the, maybe another uh, pioneer person might have thought, hey, that looks really comfortable. You know, same with me. A native youth person might have saw what I'm wearing and said, wow, that looks crazy, but that kind of looks comfortable. <laughs> So this is what I like to talk about a little bit is the constant of change and everything, the evolving of people and cultures. So what I like to present is a more down-to-earth, realistic view of Native people, like Nina stated. You know, some presentations, you know, it's more about the flash, pizzazz, feathers, you know, the same kind of stereotype a little bit. Whereas I like to approach it a little different, where it's just a more down-to-earth realistic view you know there's there's good and bad in every culture and the same with native people we're not all spiritual native people praying in a sweat lodge we're you know some people are you know doing whatever they're doing just as it is in society with all people like I'm sure there's a you know the priest down the road and then there's the you know homeless person in the street just a few feet away it's the same with Native people as well. So I like to just point that out and just point out the realistic, you know, side of Native people. But I also like to celebrate the positive things that are happening, the retaining of our culture. Like I stated just a few minutes ago, I introduced myself in the little bit of youth that I know. Uh, my parents were not raised with the Native language as fluently as my grandparents were. When I was a little kid, I used to hear my grandparents speaking Ute, and to me it was like a code talk on like, what do you hear? What does that mean? What do you? And they wouldn't really tell me. And a part of that belief was they did not want me to have a hard time with my education. In their mind, education was the key to be successful in American society. And their time growing up when they were young was, it was not cool to be a native, a Ute person, an Indian. It was a really hard time for Native people in the 1940s and 50s growing up as their younger years in the 30s, 20s, 30s because there was a lot of animosity, a lot of uh, racism, a lot of discrimination, prejudice and so they had to endure that and so growing up they taught my parents, well, we don't want you to have the same problems so we're, we, we want you to just learn English and so that is a, one of the breaks there with myself, with my native language. But like I said, in my growing up in school, it's a return back to our native culture and native ways. And it's a lot, maybe was lost, but we're reintroducing or reintegrating a lot of our language and culture in our ways. Um, some things were not completely lost, like uh, some of our prayers and spiritual beliefs and religious ceremonies, they had to go underground in a way, but um, they survived. Just like our, um, in my tribe, in the Northern Ute tribe, our main ones religiously is the Sundance ceremony. There's two Sundances we have on our reservation. 
And another one is our youth bear dance, which I am really, really highly involved in. And these dances have been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. But for a time period, it was kind of almost illegal for these things to happen. So they had to incorporate ways to make it okay in, in the eyes of uh, the non-Indian American society of the time, which was to introduce the Christian aspect of some things. Oh, look, we're praying to Jesus or we're praying to, you know, the Christian side, see? So it's, um, it's okay. And so that made it okay for, you know, the non-native people. Oh, okay, there's a Christian aspect to it. So it's okay. Same with the Pueblo people, I noticed. Um, I went to school for one year at the boarding school in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a um, school that was made up for the Pueblo people, the 19 Pueblo tribes of the Rio Grande down in uh, New Mexico. And their culture, I noticed, is really integrated with the Christian aspect because they wanted to retain their culture and their language, and this was their only way they could keep it strong in their, in their mind at the time. So they incorporated a lot of Christianity in it. Um, whereas my, uh, my father's side, my father's tribe, the Hopi side, they didn't, they didn't use the Christian side. There's no Christian in it. Um, so in my mind, I think that's kind of very lucky to not have the Christian side. And um, I don't know if this is, uh, in my perspective, in my perception, I think I'm lucky to be a heathen. I'm a bona fide heathen. I'm not uh, baptized in any uh, any uh, Christian way or anything. But I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, what it is, you know, Christianity, the people that believe in it and follow, you know, the right, the twelve commandments, you know, all the ways to be a good person. I don't mind that. That's cool. Um, but I'm sure it's changed over thousands of years with the interpretations and meanings behind Christianity and politicized. And I mean, you could just watch the news and see how it's used that way. But um, that's another example of the change of time, I guess. Um, but back to my Indian stuff, my native stuff. I also like to joke about that all the time with the, the word Indian. And the, I don't mind it myself because I've grown up with that myself. But like I you know, joke with uh, some of these presentations, I've really met people from India. And they, they correct me. They've corrected me about that. So, and it makes me think, and it, you know, it's a, it's a real thing. You know, we aren't Indians. We're native people. We're, and, and then the question comes up, well, what are you? Or what, sh what, do, what do we like to be called? And it boils down to just learning about our people in our history, in our language and culture. And what we identify with is our, whatever tribe we are, whatever tribal nation we are. So I'm Ute. So you're a Ute American, just like Nina's a Italian American descent. I'm a Ute American descent, and Hopi and Choctaw, and learning about these, you know, different tribes. Just like some of you, we're all Americans, but some of you are coming back from a different background of European background, of German American descent, Italian American, Polish American, Russian American, um, Arabic maybe, or whatever it is. Uh, Spanish sides, you know, the Hispanic people. And then I also like to point out, you know, um, some of the mainstream American society culture, everything is coming from, rooted from Europe. Like our language we speak, English, Amer even though it's American English, is born from England, right? Just like uh, Spanish, Spanish comes from Spain. These are all rooted in Europe. So that's what makes the difference, I guess, from an indigenous culture of the Americas and the American culture. I think um, what, uh, what I find out in my, um, in my lifetime here is that um, this is a very sensitive subject when I talk about my native heritage to um, where I live now. It, it's a very sensitive subject that creates a lot of uh, instinctive reaction of negativity because people don't like to feel bad about something they feel they had no part of. Because I know none of us were alive 150 years ago when things happened. None of us had a part of it. But we're living with the effects of it now, still. And uh, when I have this conversation, I've been living in the Roaring Fork Valley for 12 years now, which is uh, Glenwood Springs to Aspen. 
And there's not a big native community there of Ute people of any tribes, really. There's a few tribes, a few um, Navajos I've ran into, a few other native people. But for the most part, there's, there's, it's a big non-native population of uh, just uh, regular Americans and uh, maybe some immigrants that are there now as well. Um, but when the subject of native people and heritage comes up, I always notice that when I start to speak on things just to regular Joe, Work, worker bee people, they, they get a negative reaction. And I, I'm, I still am trying to figure out how to have this conversation and discussion to make it a proactive healing process so that we can better understand each other's cultures and learn to you know, move forward in a positive direction without you know, hanging on and clinging on to a negative aspect of it. And I've noticed some of the discussion when you talk about you know, the atrocities and the negative and really emphasize the negative all the time, it turns people off and people don't want to hear it anymore. And they just be like, oh, whatever, I'm, I'm out. I don't want to hear that. I wasn't a part of it. So people walk away from it and then nothing happens. It just stays the same. And then you move to five years later and it's still the same discussion and the same feeling. So what I am trying to figure out is to find a way where we can have this discussion and... Um, move forward in a positive direction so but what one thing i'd like to point out all the time that creates this negativity is when i point out the disconnection of american people from their roots and once people embrace their roots i notice with some people that it it, it works when people embrace the european roots of their history and culture then it's it's more of a positive forward direction there's an acceptance and an acknowledgement of where we're all coming from. And then that's a, a, a move forward in my mind, or what I've seen with some people. But if you choose always to disconnect from your culture, your heritage and roots, then there's, there's always going to be some sort of a negative, you know, lost. You're kind of lost. You don't know where you're coming from. And I notice with um, American society, there's a big disconnection because there's a disconnection. We're not um, European anymore, we're Americans. We're not from Europe, we're Americans. Even though we're using English forms of measurement, which is weird because the rest of the world is using metric, but we're hanging on to an old world style of English measurement. Why? If we're so separated from Europe and England, why are we using English forms of me measurement? That's, that's the funny thing to me. But anyways, um, some of, the, some of the things that I point out like that, I, I think it, it just the first reaction is always negative. But when we talk about it in a positive way and figure out a way how we can you know, just acknowledge it and say, hey, that's cool. You know, that's, that's really cool. Your culture is a little different than my culture, but you know, I'm okay with that. We don't need to hate on it as well, as much. Um, that's something I think that helps the discussion is learning to just not be um, prejudiced about things prejudging a culture because it's so different than another culture. Um, perspective, learning how to put yourself in the other culture's shoes and try as hard as you can to understand why it's that way, or even if you don't understand why, just acknowledging that you don't know and that it's gonna be different, but you're okay with that. Um, that's something I think um, that we can work on as well with the native cultures is um, seeing how the native people perceive things. Like even though what happened a long time ago is in the past, we don't want, people tell me all the time that I need to get over it, get over it, get over it. I'm like, get over what? Like this is my family and relatives you're talking about, get over my relations? Because that's part of the connection with native people. I think that's a little different than the non-native American people is like even though these people are gone a hundred years ago that's my family even though they're gone uh, one year ago that's still my family we are still connected to them to them that's my ancestors that's whose blood and uh, genetics are flowing through me it's what makes my, my skin dark makes my eyes and my facial bone structure the way it is they're living on through myself so that's my family and you're telling me to get over my family and my language and my culture and everything that identifies me as a different 
you know, culture as one of the first nations and the first peoples of the land here. And I think people don't want to feel bad about that because they see it in me and they, it's a remind, it's a, I guess a hurtful reminder of history that's happened that they feel they don't have a part of, which they don't, but um, being dismissive of the whole thing is actually indirectly supporting it in a way, in my mind, in my, in my opinion, anyway. So at least acknowledging it is, is a move forward as well, I think, instead of just being dismissive and saying, well, you know, that's, that's whatever. And that's indirectly supporting it in a way. And saying to get over it all the time is also indirectly supporting it. It's more or less telling me I need to um, not be Indian or not be native anymore, like what happened to my grandparents, you know, when they were told not to speak the language, not to practice our religion, practice our spiritual ways. When you're telling me to get over it, you're also telling me to do the same thing. It's pretty much the same thing in my mind. Uh, telling me I can't do a bear dance, sun dance, you know, any of those things anymore when you're telling me to get over it. So that's a discussion I, I think that we can work on as well. Um, but anyways, that's a little bit I'm sharing of what I think, and I am only one person, and these, these are only my opinions. And I'm, I'm pulling from my own experience growing up as a native on the reservation. I grew up in the Northern Ute Reservation, which is based in northeastern Utah. And um, I also um, visited my Hopi side, my father's side in uh, northeastern Arizona as well. So those two cultures that I grew up with um, really shaped how I view the world and what I think of things. I also, you know, base a lot of my opinions on books I've read by uh, on native subjects. A big author that I was really into really brought some fire into me when I was a youthful person, really made me mad, was uh, Vine Deloria Jr. I don't know if you've heard of this author. He's an awesome, he's passed away now, but uh, he was a Native American or a Native author, and he um, did a lot of social commentary books on Native issues of his time, and it pertains, and it still relates to today's day and age. So that is a little bit of my background, what I base, what I talk about in these um, presentations about um, a lot of um, my education background. I've had some college. Um, I'm a bona fide, also a bona fide college dropout. I plan to finish <laughs> someday, but um, just life in general, you know, I've had my ups and downs. I'm not the perfect, you know, example of a good person, but I think uh, that's all of us as well. We, we've all got our faults as well. Um, but I plan on going back to school and finishing that, working on something uh, to help me uh, do these presentations as well. Um, but anyways, that's a little bit of my background of where I'm coming from and uh, what I do. Uh, like Nina said, a lot of our presentations are with the schools. And what I like to do is um, show a visual aspect of uh, my native culture. And I bring up here some of my, um, what I wear at the powwows. I've, been, I've grown up uh, involved in powwows. Have, have you guys heard of powwows? Definitely. So I kind of um, show my beadwork. This is what I've worn and I'm, I'm a, what they call a grass dancer. I participate in a, at the powwows as a grass dancer. So I grew up as a little boy involved with um, powwow. My parents were involved with powwow and I think that's how they met. So that's how I became a Ute Hopi Choctaw guy. <laughs> um, so because they were involved in powwow. I was involved in powwow and I was a little kid, two years old, you know, already in a powwow outfit dancing at powwows. And I just um, grew up with it and it's just a part of me that's so much a part of me I can't think of really not it being not a part of me. So when I um, talk to the little kids, I kind of more or less just put on my powwow outfit in front of them.
And in a way, it's like I transform in front of them. So this is only the beadwork part of my outfit that I, I put on. And then I just describe, you know, now I look like a real native. And they say, yeah. <laughs> so this is just a, a part of my culture that's a little different, I guess. But it's also an, an American culture, uh, indigenous Native American culture, you know, getting into all these uh, politically correct words and descriptive words, but, you know, or you can just say there's an Indian, <laughs> but, but that's not really accurate either. Um, so this is my beadwork that I, that I show the kids and actually all of you, everybody, the non-Native people. And this is just something that I wear at the powwows when I'm participating in the grass dance. And then uh, I notice with a lot of the schools, there's a lot of uh, Latino kids, Latino, Hispanic kids. And um, their culture is a little different. It's another part of American culture, but it's a little different. And I ask them, is there a part of your culture that you wear like this, maybe at something you do? And at first they, they, they struggle, and then I just kind of you know, push it forward, say, is there, I've heard of a quinceanera? And then they'll talk about the, oh yeah, yeah, the quinceanera. And they say, is there something you wear there? And they say, yeah, we wear this, we wear that. And, okay, and then see, I, I, I'm very ignorant when it comes to um, Hispanic culture, so I, I don't know if there really is a Mexican hat dance or not. So I say, is there a Mexican hat dance? And they they kind of look at me funny. So. But there are, you know, Hispanic cultural dances that they do which is integrated with the Christian and some of the native uh, Mexico people. Um, they're, they're, um, they're evolving of culture, just like the native people of North America and the United States, how the Native American church, you know, that, that incorporates a lot of the Christian ways in their prayers, I notice nowadays. And that's just what I guess you would call the evolution of culture just like American society and American pop culture has evolved over the last hundred years. Change is constant. Native people change as well. So even though, you know, this outfit, this beadwork might be a little more than what they wore a hundred years ago, the meaning and the dancing behind it is very similar and very much the, close to the same. It's uh, rooted in older dances of the grass dance from a plains tribe and today it's danced and it's shared with a lot of different native tribes. So if there was ever anything that you could call pan-native where a lot of all the tribes participate in something, it's the Native American powwow culture and dance. You'll go to a powwow, you'll see a lot of these dances that are rooted in the Plains cultural tribes, but you'll see Navajos dancing these dances. You'll see Seminoles possibly, you'll see Chippewas, Lakotas, um, different tribes from everywhere. California now, some, some of the tribes from California, I notice have, you know, they're picked up the powwow cultural ways and they have a big, big uh, circuit of powwows in California with big prize money. So over the last 50, 60 years, powwow culture has evolved to incorporate a lot of contest dancing. So there's a grass dance contest, there's a fancy shawl dance, there's a women's traditional dance contest, and some of the prize money is up into the thousands of dollars. So you can make a pretty good living if you're a very good dancer going to the circuit of all these powwows. I used to do that in my teen years and early 20s, and I was okay, you know, I was able to, you know, get around <coughs> placing in these contests as well. I'm sure some of you have heard of the Denver March powwow in Denver, Colorado, every March. Um, I actually placed in the contests in my teen years at that powwow. So that is my history of powwow culture, so that's something I can you know, explain a little bit about. Um, but there's also the traditional tribal aspect. When I talk about the tribal traditional aspect of nations, I like to talk about and make a comparison to Europe. Because when I've been, to, I've been to Europe quite a bit. When I've been to Europe, to me, I see it the same side as you would see the Indians at a powwow. You go to a powwow, you see all these Indians, and you're not too sure, they're all just a bunch of Indians, right? Dancing around, doing their thing. So when I go to Europe, 
you know, that, that was me too. There's all a bunch of white people, you know. But they're all German, French, Polish, you know, the Deutschlanders, you know, I learned a lot of, you know, what makes them identify with their traditional tribal nation of Europe. And their history goes back thousands of years. And I thought, hey, well, that's like us over on this land in North America. Our traditional ways go back thousands of years, too. And we're Ute, we're Lakota, we're Cheyenne, Arapaho, different nations of people. And we're, we might be a little bit different, but there's a similarity in our tribalistic ways, just like they are in Europe still to this day. When I was speaking to them, this was back in the 90s, and this is when they were starting the European Union, a lot of the people, they were against it. They were like, we don't want to be like the United States. We don't want to just be a bunch of European white people. We want to identify with who we are. We're Italian. We're not, you know, German or, you know, whatever they are, you know, with the European Union. That was just the normal everyday people in Europe, the Europeans, not the politicians. The politicians have their own whole different thing, just like here. You know, the politicians who we choose to speak for us and, you know, guide us in our society, you know, that's, that's something we all have to do, live with. But, um, <laughs> and we have to deal with the consequences of what they do as well, just like what we're going with today with immigration and everything, you know, that's, that's an issue, but, you know, it's the politicians. But anyways, it's, it's been the same constant thing, I think, for hundreds of years. Um, but anyways, back to the differences of uh, cultural beliefs and everything. Um, like Nina said, you know, we're coming from a whole different lifestyle. Native people, our culture and lifestyle was tied with nature. Um, moving with nature, the elements, migrations of deer and elk, um, that's embedded in us in our genes, I think, because we still hunt. We're pretty good hunters, I, I would say, still on the reservation, although not everybody you know, goes out with a bow and arrow and a spear, people use, you know, I use a 300 Weatherby mag. It's a really nice, can reach a long ways. I don't have to sneak as close as you would with a bow. But um, it fills my freezer, and when we, um, try, when we can, we try to eat, you know, natural game meat. You know, we have buffalo, we have elk, we have deer, and we still dry a lot of meat, you know, in an older traditional way. Um, there's people on the reservation who dry meat the same way, but instead of using deer or um, wood, making the wood, uh, uh, what is that called, little triangle grid thing where you dry meat from, they use a, a wire or a chicken wire or something, you know, to dry the meat over the smoke. You know, that's just an adaptation. Um, another uh, example of adaptation, but, you know, it's still the same stuff, is my drum here. This drum was made by a person up in Canada of uh, the Cree Nation, but the person that made this drum, it's still deer hide, but the rim is, you know, commercially bought, and instead of using rawhide string or buckskin, it's, you know, baling wire or twine from, you know, baling hay. So that's adaptation, that's just um, evolution, evolving, cultural evolving, but it's still used for the same things. So, anyways, moving forward, um, what I also like to show is, uh, share with people is, uh, like I said, I grew up with powwow and everything. I share a little bit of um, singing because I grew up singing at the drums, and um, the kids really get a kick out of it. At first, Nina can attest to this. At first, they're, because they've never heard it, you know, they'll laugh a little bit at first because they're nervous because it's so different but um, once they you know get used to me singing in front of them some of them will actually come up to me afterwards and say hey I learned that song I know that song now I can sing it and they really like it and they get a big kick out of it so I'll share with you a little bit of um, powwow singing if you don't mind um, there's a, a song that they sing at the powwows called the flag song and it's, it was composed and made in the past for the American flag and they usually have this at the, what, what they call the grand entry of a powwow. Um, so powwow also evolved a little bit from these old native dances. 
But there was a guy called um, Buffalo Bill, I think it was Buffalo Bill or Wild Bill Cody, who um, had a Wild West show, and he incorporated a lot of Indian dances in his Wild West shows. And to me, I, I believe this is where a lot of the modern powwow influence comes from as well, with the grand entry and bringing in the American flags and everything like that. So this is the song they sing for the American flag at these powwows. flag song there's also it depends on which tribe there's a Lakota flag song which has a lot of Lakota words in it um, but that one I don't know because I'm not Lakota so I can't really <laughs> sing those words but I do know one Lakota song um, it's called a horse stealing song <laughs> because there it is again another perspective back in the old old days it was a an act of bravery to steal a horse from your enemy tribe so if the Lakotas, maybe the song was made when they were stealing from us youths, we don't know. <laughs> but um, this song was taught to me by a guy named Earl Bullhead, who's a Lakota from uh, South Dakota, I think. Um, but I'll sing it really quick because I, I remember the words so I can sing them. <laughs> sing it. And some of the songs are faster than the others, so this one's a little bit of a faster one.
you all for listening to me uh, talk and share a little bit about what it is to be a native person. I guess my perspective, my example, I guess, of it. There are many examples, and I apologize to some maybe that mind uh, out there <laughs> who might have a disagreement with me, but this is only my opinion and my, my story, my experience sharing as a Northern Ute Hopi Choctaw tribal member. So thanks for listening and sharing. Um, I think we're going to have questions. Maybe. We're, we're supposed to only go an hour, so I know we've kind of exceeded our time frame. I'll tell you what, Skylar, I mean, we'll stick around for questions unless anybody has a really burning desire that they want to ask. I just want to honor your time and thank you all for you know, coming out to, to listen to Skylar and, and myself this afternoon. So thank you.